Good morning. Good morning again. Good morning, Equal Justice Community. Good morning. I'm from Florida, and my grandmother had this thing where when we say good morning, you say good morning. So good morning. I love it. I think I can get another robust good morning. good morning. Lovely. If you could take your seats, our opening plenary will be beginning in about one minute. Thank you. Mississippi 1, Mississippi 2, Mississippi 3, Mississippi 4. I think we're good. Good morning, everyone. My name is David Bienvenue, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as the chair of the ABA Standing Committee on Pro Bono and Public Service. And on behalf of the Standing Committee, I'd like to welcome you to the 2022 Equal Justice Conference. <laughs> We are so pleased to be in the North Star, our NLADA partners and colleagues. We thank you so much for the opportunity to have this in-person conference, a gathering of advocates after two virtual iterations to share information, ideas, and inspiration for bringing access to justice to those who struggle to gain that access. Our main conference sessions will offer you the opportunity to hear about innovative models of technology, funders, pro bono, and more increasing access to justice, to increase your knowledge in substantive areas of the law, to gain management skills, and to reconnect and network with your peers. This conference the collaborative effort of the ABA and the NLADA for 24 years could not have happened without the EJC staff. I'd like to thank them for their efforts in bringing this conference together. This, the staff is here to ensure you the best conference experience possible, so if you need any assistance in the next two days, Look for the staff ribbon, and they'll be happy to help you out. I also want to thank our Minneapolis host committee and the local legal community for their extraordinary support of this conference. And I'd like to, as an aside, just thank Minnesota lawyers for your history of providing access to justice to those who cannot afford it and to help those both in the criminal justice arena uh, as well. I've gotten to know many folks from Minnesota over the years in this context, and I just cannot tell you how much lawyers around this country appreciate your leadership. We look forward to the reception that you've put together for this evening, and I hope all of you will be able to join us for a wonderful evening. This conference is one of the many ways that the Standing Committee and the American Bar Association support efforts to provide access to justice for those who cannot afford it. The knowledgeable staff of the Center for Pro Bono provides technical assistance and support in establishing, growing, or managing a pro bono program or project. Since May of 2020, the center has held monthly drop-in calls to sustain the connection between pro bono advocates across the country and to support everyone striving to continue the provision of critical legal services. The ABA convened a task force on legal needs arising from the coronavirus, COVID-19. To assess the legal needs resulting from the pandemic, to make recommendations to address those needs, to promote collaboration across the legal system, 
and to mobilize pro bono resources in support of pandemic-related legal services. The task force gathered a great deal of information and resources, all of which are available online. The ABA and the committee are also home of ABA Free Legal Answers, an online brief advice portal through which pro bono lawyers answer users' questions with, about legal matters. When we launched ABA Free Legal Answers in 2015 with our partners at Baker Donaldson, we knew this project would fill a gap in the provision of pro bono legal advice. We did not know that in just over five years, all in-person activity would shut down due to a pandemic, with the virtual world the only option for those in need of legal help as well as volunteers. ABA Free Legal Answers filled that unanticipated need as providers shifted legal services from in-person to online, and we continue to see growth in the number of users on the site as society has become more comfortable with the virtual world. Two other key initiatives of our committee would not be successful without the participation and the support of all of you here today. The first is the annual ABA Pro Bono Publico Awards, in which five recipients are recognized at the ABA annual meeting in August for their outstanding commitment to pro bono. Those recipients work with and are nominated by this community. And we are grateful to you for bringing these stellar organizations and individuals to the attention of the committee and the greater legal community. This year's recipients will be announced later this month. The second initiative, which relies on all of you, is the National Celebration of Pro Bono, which will be the week of October 23 to 29 this year. In 2020, we were unsure what to expect in a year where in-person events were few and far between. But the creativity we have seen in the virtual and hybrid events over the past two celebrations underscores the resilience of this community. We're grateful to everyone who held events in past celebrations and hope you will again join us in highlighting the good work done by the lawyers in your community, by the pro bono lawyers, as well as the legal needs that remain unmet. I hope the programming over the next two days inspires, three days, today, tomorrow, and Saturday, inspires your creativity, strengthens your resilience, and helps you strategize how we, as a community, can bring more resources to address the, per the persistent and pressing legal needs of our clients who face eviction, threats to reproductive rights, income maintenance, and income insecur insecurity, and much more. You all work to provide people with the most basic and essential needs and rights. So thank you all for being here. We are most grateful for the work you do. You make a difference, and we're honored to help you in that endeavor. I'd like to introduce my co-chair of the conference at this time, Marilyn Harp, who is the executive director of Kansas Legal Services and a leader in the NLADA. Marilyn. Good morning. <laughs> she taught you well. <laughs> I um, serve as uh, the NLADA on the on the NLADA Civil Council, and so on behalf of NLADA, I want to welcome all of you to the Equal Justice Conference. We respectfully acknowledge that we're gathering on the traditional, ancestral and contemporary lands of the Dakota and Anishabi people. Minneapolis also is the birthplace of the American Indian Movement. Both the state of Minnesota and the United States carried out genocide, ethnic cleansing, and forced removal against the Dakota as a way to acquire land. They broke promises. Despite 
centuries of colonial theft and violence, this is still indigenous land. This will always be indigenous land, and we are honored to be here. As you may know, this is the 24th uh, gathering, uh, the, the 24th time that the ABA and NLADA have collaborated to host the Equal Justice Conference. But before those official, um, the official start of that process, um, there were some other gatherings of, the, of ABA officials and legal aid lawyers. One of those occurred in the early 80s in Kansas City, and I was selected by uh, my executive director to attend that conference because it was close by. A few days before the conference, he called me up just to, make, just to discuss the logistics. And during that call, he reminded me that this event was gonna happen in a fancy hotel. That there were going to be ABA officials there, really important ABA officials. And then he inquired what I planned to wear to this event. I shrugged and said, my court suit? And he said, and he replied without missing a beat, well, only if you shave your legs. Now, I bring up this story. You were supposed to laugh there a little bit. <laughs> I bring up this story only to tell you how far we've come in this partnership, in uh, the ways to, to highlight the relationship that we've, that we've formed between legal aid lawyers and the ABA, and also, uh, to make the important point, the point that we're all important people now, and you can't always tell who we are by how we dress anymore. On behalf of the NLADA, thank you to the ABA Standing Committee for the partnership that makes this event possible. I'd also like to extend my thanks to the EJC staff over the years who have ensured that we never miss a year don't forget to join that staff tonight for a, a drink celebrating Don Saunders. Uh, that, that is tomorrow night after the workshops. And to the staff who ensure that this year continued to build upon conference past. Thank you to the program working groups and the leaders and to, the pres to our presenters and speakers and to our wonderful host committee here in Minneapolis. I hope everyone is able to attend tonight's story slam and the reception. Of course, thanks to all of you who are joining us. What a tremendous show of support that we can all be here, whether you're presenting or attending, and likely both. Over the years, over the past two years, we've convened this group virtually. But so this is the first time in three years that the Equal Justice Committee has gathered together in person. What could we say about those years? We could say that they were years of loss and grieving, and they were. We could say that it was hard, and it still is. But there's all, they've also been years of accomplishment, of innovation and togetherness. They were years when we as a community united in collaboration and innovation to find ways to deliver justice, to save homes, to save lives. We have seen how the COVID-19 pandemic not only exposed, but exacerbated severe inequalities in our systems and in our society. We know that we still have a long way to go to achieve equal justice. The Legal Services Corporation's recent update to its Justice Gap study revealed, unsurprisingly, that over the last five years, the gap has become wider. Low-income Americans do not receive or any or enough help for 92% of their civil legal problems. But there's hope an understanding of how the law affects people differently based on race and income 
and the role of poverty law in saving lives, in delivering the fairness and justice implied on the facade of the U.S. Supreme Court at long last will be represented within this, that storied institution. Not far from here on a church, a sign quotes Cornell West, justice is what love looks like in public. That's something that I'm going to take away from this conference. And we, the Legal Aid, Pro Bono, Access to Justice Commission, law schools, foundations, and supporters, government, courts, technologists, and partners in social sciences, and social justice, we will continue. Because committed to social, equal justice, we can get there. That commitment, those collaborations, are what this conference is about. So remember, we celebrate and congratulate each other. Hug each other if you have a green band, elbow bumps if yellow, and wave from a distance to those who are wearing red, uh, red armbands. We deserve this time together. Wel welcome again, and on behalf of NLADA, enjoy the conference and each other. Thank you, Marilyn. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our, next, introduce our next guest, who will speak to us by way of a pre-recorded video. Senator Amy Klobuchar is the first woman elected to represent the state of Minnesota in the United States Senate. She graduated magna cum laude from Yale University and the University of Chicago Law School. Throughout her public service, Senator Klobuchar has always embraced the values she learned growing up here in Minnesota. She has built a reputation of putting partisan aside to help strengthen the economy and support families, workers, and businesses. She's worked across party lines to expand education and employment opportunities for returning service members. She's fought to ensure that Minnesota National Guard members received full benefits they earned. She helped turn Minnesota's groundbreaking Beyond the Yellow Ribbon program into a national model, and so, so much more. I'm sure that so many of us here today are familiar with Senator Klobuchar's uh, leadership in the United States Senate, um, where she works every day to defend the rights of all Americans, but clearly demonstrates the compassion that all of you share in addressing the needs of those less fortunate among us. So it is with great pleasure and honor I introduce and present to you this morning for our keynote, Senator Amy Klobuchar. Please watch the video.
to having a seat at the table. That matters. All of you are vital to ensuring our justice system lives up to the promise inscribed above the entrance to the Supreme Court, equal justice under law. And while you work day in and day out doing the tough work on the ground, I know there's more we can do in Washington to improve our justice system. Few things we've been working on. First, member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, I know you know that I work hard on these issues along with Senator Durbin and the rest of the Democrats on that committee to make sure that our federal judges bring a variety of professional experiences to the bench and that they reflect the diverse country that we live in. That's a big part, but not the only part of why I was proud to support that historic nomination of Judge Jackson, soon to be Justice Jackson. When she takes her seat on the Supreme Court, not only will she be the first black woman on the court, but she will also be the first justice with experience, as I noted, as a federal public defender. By virtue of her very presence on the court, she will show little girls and boys across this country that anything and everything is possible. And boy, did she deserve that day in the sun out there on the White House lawn after getting out of the cave that was the Senate Judiciary Committee hearing. There was no take crews out on that lawn. There was no Tom Cotton out on that lawn. She deserved that moment. She's got an incredible experience, and I can't wait to see what she's going to do as a justice. But we've also confirmed another 58 of President Biden's judicial nominees to federal courts, including 30 women, more than two-thirds of whom are women of color. I was especially proud, as I noted, to support Kate Kimberbe. And by the way, when you look at people like Kate Menendez, five years as a federal magistrate or judge, and nearly two decades as a federal defender, I have every confidence she will serve Minnesota and our country with distinction. The Senate also needs to move forward and pass police reform that addresses misconduct, increases transparency in policing practices, and improve police conduct and training, including banning chokeholds. Our colleague, Senator Cory Booker, has been leading the way on this, and I look forward to working with him. We never take no for the answer. Another thing we need to do, number three, I've long supported efforts to increase federal funding for legal aid, including the most recent budget, because I know that our justice system is most effective and most credible when everyone has the best possible representation. Number four, judicial reform, bipartisan legislation, to create one-stop shop reentry centers so that those who have served their time in criminal justice reform can find housing, access health care, get a driver's license, and begin job training. These centers reduce the stress of reentry and the likelihood of recidivism. Number five, we have to recognize that there are some problems that are best handled outside of the criminal justice system, especially when it comes to drug use. That's why I'm leading efforts to improve and modernize treatment courts in this country and give nonviolent offenders the support that they need. And one more thing I would add, that at this critical moment in history, we also have to look at reviewing convictions, right? Um, that's why some of the review boards and things that we have pushed for across the country are really, really important, and I'm also leading a bill on that. Last thing I'm going to tell you is this. Our judges must work for the people of today. And I think that's something that Breyer actually said. Um, and I think that when you think about what's going on in some of the courtrooms right now, especially some of the decisions we've seen coming out of the Supreme Court, we have to remember our courts must work for the people of the day. But you know who does work for the people of today? You. You work every day to make our justice system work for everyone. You represent people with limited resources at the most challenging moments of their lives. You fight for them to prevent unlawful eviction, to ensure fair immigration hearings, and to secure access to public benefits. You stand up for justice and equity, and in doing so, you make our entire system stronger. And if you think it doesn't matter the work you've done, if you feel down sometimes, I'll end with one story. A little girl named Maddie, I was taking a walk the day that President Biden announced that he was looking for a new justice, and Stephen Breyer announced his retirement. And her dad jumps out of a car, and he said, gives me a letter. And he, I had never known, he never met me. He said, this is my daughter, Maddie, this is the letter that she sent. She's 11 years old, she sent a letter to President Biden, African American little girl. 
and she said that she wants to be the next Supreme Court Justice. She had strong arguments, friends. She argued that number one, she was only 11 years old, so she could live a really long time in the Number two, she could be a for kids that seem to be omitted lately in our justice system. And number three, if he was worried about how she'd get to work, because she's only 11, uh, she only lived six months in the courts so if she could walk. So I ended up bringing Maddie Morgan as my guest to Judge Jackson's hearing. And she came up to me on the break and she said, you know what, uh, if I was going to be sort of passed over, it couldn't be for a better person. <laughs> I was in that little girl's eyes and she just saw her own future in Judge Jackson's face. For people, you are their guardian angels. They see their futures through you. So thank you for everything you do. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Keep up the great work. You deserve it. Thanks, everyone. taken twice as long had she been here in person because the applause uh, would have stopped her half the, through three quarters of what she said. Thank you so, so much for uh, Senator Klobuchar um, and for whomever and all of the whomevers uh, that were instrumental in making that possible. I would now like to introduce um, David uh, Lillehog to introduce our next presenter. David is senior counsel at Fredrickson and Byron and he will be introducing our next speaker. But I want to tell you that I, I didn't mention this earlier. Um, I shouldn't be making a plug. I shouldn't be saying something about one particular firm but so much of the experience I alluded to over my years in this space about the dedication of Minnesota lawyers, so many of them came from come from, so to your firm over its history, thank you for all you do. David was a United States Attorney for the District of Minnesota prior to practicing at Fredrickson for 11 years before serving on the Minnesota Supreme Court for seven years. He currently focuses his practice on corporate and governmental investigations, administrative law, and complex civil litigation. I'd like you to please welcome him to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Banvenu, for those kind words. And thank you for the plug, too. And the credit really goes to our pro bono coordinator, Pam Wenzel. <laughs> and welcome, Equal Justice Conference, to the land of 10,000 lakes. It's actually more like 14,000, maybe a couple more after last night. <laughs> but Minnesotans are famous for understatement. We are definitely nice, but in a low-key way, if you know what I mean. I was reminded of that last week when I attended the memorial service for one of my mentors, Vice President Walter Mondale, who, by the way, was one of the chief authors of the bill that created the Legal Services Corporation. Both of our U.S. Senators, Amy Klobuchar, who you just heard, and Tina Smith, spoke at the service. So she had visited Mr. Mondale in his final days on Earth. At the end of the visit, knowing they wouldn't see each other again, she placed her hand on his shoulder and leaned over and whispered, I love you, Mr. Mondale. He looked up at her and responded, I've always been very high on you as well. <laughs> That's Minnesota. Your main speaker this morning is Minnesotan to the core, but she's one of the rare ones who's not afraid to tell you exactly what she thinks. You will see that today. Anne McCaig grew up, grew up dirt poor in Federal Dam, Minnesota. There's not a chance in the world she won't tell you today about Federal Dam. She's a member of the White Earth Band of Ojibwe, and she'll tell you what it was like on the res. Growing up, she wanted to be a country singer. She'll tell you about that, I expect, and maybe even sing about it. For many years, she was an assistant DA who did child protection cases. She will tell you about that stressful and life-saving work. Then she was appointed to the district court bench. She will tell you about the people, especially in family court, 
who came before her. And finally, Justice McKay will tell you about her time on the Minnesota Supreme Court. It's coming up on six years. Her appointment was historic. She was the first Native woman appointed to any court of last resort in the history of the United States of America. I predict that it will take you only a minute or two to conclude that this is no ordinary justice. This is no inhabitant of the judicial monastery where the opinions are long and the air is stale. Every day on the Minnesota Supreme Court, Justice McCaig is a gust of fresh air. She brings her real life experience into the deliberation room and she does more community outreach and individual acts of kindness than just about any judge anywhere. Today, please jump into her fishing boat on Federal Dam Lake and join her in navigating her surprising, twisting voyage to Minnesota's highest court, Justice Ann McCaig. Yo, yo, yo. Bonjour. Oh, that was pathetic. Let's try it again. Boujou. Better, better. Uh, David Lillehog was funny. I don't know what to say. What is this, what is this world coming to? Uh, before we do anything, I have to take a picture because I have five kids and um, they don't believe that anybody wants to hear me speak. So, and I, I thought I was done doing this, but then I mentioned it again and they just roll their eyes like, well, yeah, whatever. They don't think I go anywhere. So if you could all squeeze in. Okay, you all look great, but wait one moment. Okay, that's good. Thank you very much. Uh, when I came here this morning, all I thought was, holy Shedinsky, there is a lot of you here. Um, despite the fact that I was told that, and I'm gonna keep this here just so I can try to keep you on time. Hopefully it won't fall off. Uh, First of all, I just want to echo the thanks that Senator Klobuchar said to all of you for the work that you do every day because it is incredibly important and um, especially for all of the people that surrounded me in my life who uh, need people like you. I am incredibly uh, grateful to all of you for the work that you do. Uh, my name is Ann McKaig, but my uh, Anishinaabe name is Awanakwe and that means mist woman, and I was given to me by some elder friends of mine who said that it is the mist that overlays the white earth nation in the early mornings as the protector of the land, which was really an awesome experience. I only received my name a few years ago, right before the pandemic, and that just sort of represents the path that we as Native people have had and that we've lost a lot of our history along the way. So it was a very emotional time for me when I received my name, and I'm very proud of it. Um, you know, thinking about your conference today, I was thinking, you know, the two words, equal justice. You know, what does that mean? I think it means something different for everyone, and it's always informed by where we come from and what our life experience has been. So with your permission, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself because it certainly forms who I am as a person, who I became as a lawyer, and who I continue to become as a judicial officer. I did grow up in Federal Dam, Minnesota. Woo woo! Yes, population 106. We used to have two bars. Uh, now we have one that I'm sure has a lot of OSHA violations and should not be operating. Uh, in fact, it's not supposed to even to really be selling any uh, any hard liquor, but I think a few bottles have come out of there, as well as a few other things, but that's, you know, I digress. Uh, growing up there was a lot of freedom. It's the best place. It's the place where my heart and my soul is. I've already bought my, uh, my cemetery lot for 50 bucks. I think that's a bargain deal. I'm like, just, you know, throw me in the flames and throw me in the ground there and I'll be happy. I come from uh, my mother who was a Fulbright scholar. She grew up in Bemidji, not too far away, about 40 miles from Federal Dam. She went to the College of St. Catherine, big dreams, wanted to be in the Peace Corps. Uh, she was gonna travel the world, save all kinds of people. She was engaged seven times. Seems excessive, don't you think? 
Uh, but she met my dad when she was playing in a dance band, and my dad couldn't be any more opposite. He was a union guy, a labor guy. He was very simple beginnings. He believed that if you couldn't get your hands dirty, that you didn't hold a whole lot of value. And so the melding of these two people resulted in my mother finally saying yes. They got married, uh, and then they had the first of my very mediocre brothers, um, <laughs> followed by three more mediocre brothers. I mean, it went, the first one born in February of 65, the second in 66, Angel from Heaven falls in 67, that would be me. And then it was followed by two more very mediocre brothers, and they love it when I say this. It's been the best thing about getting this gig is that I can publicly shame them for the rest of my days. You all know what I'm talking about. How many of you are the favorite child? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you are not the favorite child? Okay. This is what I'm talking about. When my oldest brother comes home, my mother makes sure that there, his iced tea is in the fridge. His original childhood home or bedroom is clean, despite the fact that he will not sleep in there. And that he gets roast beef, mashed potatoes, and cherry cheesecake. He's done nothing in life. I think I've done fairly well. I have not had a lemon meringue pie since I was in high school. You know what I'm talking about. When I think about interaction with the criminal, not the criminal justice system, but the justice system overall, for me, I, my very first experience was really not until much later in life. I mean, I knew people that had been arrested. I knew people that were losing housing. I knew people who had a lot of challenges, as uh, you know, was the area of people who really suffered in poverty. But my family experience didn't come till much later, and that was when my brothers were hit by a drunk driver. Uh, the two oldest mediocre brothers were hit by a drunk home in Federal Dam with my mother. But that very first interaction was very disappointing. alcoholic. He was a very troubled individual, but he served less than 90 days in jail. Not that the time in jail necessarily would bring back all that had happened, but I know that for my family, it was extremely disappointing, let alone the civil lawsuit that resulted in essentially nothing. So it is my family who takes care of my brother. And one of the conversations that I've had with Justice Lillehog has been the challenges as I do public service, because we all know that we're not in it for the money, but it's that, you know, we have responsibilities, and I know that someday I will have to take care of him. I think sort of perhaps uh, helped me decide that I wanted to go to law school. I decided in ninth grade after, actually, I did want to be a country music singer. I was going to Nashville, as I told my mother. I go out walking after midnight out in the moonlight. Just like we used to do, I'm always walking after midnight searching for you. <laughs> See, now my mother didn't think that. She was like, let's have a plan B. So she tricked me. So I went to law school. I left Federal Dam, which was hard enough for those of you who are, have our, uh, an attachment to where you grew up, especially, I think, in rural Minnesota. It was a challenge to leave Federal Dam and to come a place that seemed very foreign to me. There was too many people. There was too much traffic. There was too much noise. Um, and a lot of people that I just, um, their lifestyle was very different than what I had experienced on the reservation. So it was a challenge in making it through college and, and making myself sort of get out of the ditch and find my people, but I did, I managed. And then I went on to law school, and then it was really about getting that first job, and I was lucky that I landed a job in the Hennepin County Attorney's Office. Now, I didn't know anything about the Hennepin County Attorney's Office, but I knew that I needed a job because I was working for the Army Corps of Engineers, and it was a permanent job, and it was a real struggle for me to give up permanent job and to go to a temporary job at the time because I had to pay my bills. There's no backup plan. Nobody in my family could help support me. But it was a really good decision, and I'm so glad that I made that decision because it was there that I was able to work in child welfare and to really work with my community, the Indian community, uh, in trying to do a better by the way that we were handling Indian child welfare cases. 
Uh, one of my really, really good friends, Myrnie Haney, is here today. Um, she works for Legal Aid in Omaha. Yeah, who knows Myrnie? In the house. Woohoo! Way in the back. Do you love her? She's real embarrassed. There's a Myrnie Haney fan club. I could be the president, the vice president, the founder, co-founder. I'll join you all later. But Myrnie was a hell of an attorney. And she really did help try to train me. Uh, there's been many people who have tried to, you know, help reform me, you know, soften the rigid edges. It's, it's not really worked. I mean, Justice Lowe's Hogg was like, do not swear in your speeches. And I'm like, actually, I think that people like that. Anyway, Myrnie had the reservations, and we were able to do a lot of really good work. And it's still one of my most favorite jobs of all time. And, of course, uh, Myrnie, one of my favorite people, and she's carried that with her to Omaha. But it was during that time that I actually had the opportunity to see the swearing-in of the very first Native American judge in district court in the Twin Cities. His name is Robert Blazer. He was also from the White Earth Reservation. I did not know him. But I went and I watched his investiture and I sat in the back of the room and it was the very first time that I thought perhaps maybe this girl from Federal Dam could actually become a judge. And I was lucky because he came down to juvenile court and I was appearing before him and I remember going and talking to him and he took me on as his mentee despite the fact that I didn't think I needed one because I was 25 and I knew everything. He knew, the, he knew much better. And so he became my mentor, and I asked him one day, I said, you know, do you think I could ever become a judge? He said, no. <laughs> Not unless you start to listen to all the things that I'm trying to tell you. Because I was one of those, you know, I'd roll my eyes, and I'd throw the pen, and I'd just be like, oh, that's the most ridiculous argument I've ever heard. He'd call me back in chambers. I'd roll my eyes at what he was telling me about not rolling my eyes. And he really worked hard and diligent to try to get through me, my head that it was important that we have representation throughout the system, including the bench, because it's important to those who come before the court. And so it was he who, after my time on the district court bench, when I eventually got there, um, that came to me yet again and told me that there was an opening on the Minnesota Supreme Court. And I thought he was going to apply. So I asked him, so you're going to apply. This is what happens when you're in my line of sight, just by the way. And he said, no, you are. Now, I thought he'd been consuming over the lunch hour because I had just gotten in trouble for almost burning down the Family Justice Center by leaving a, wallet, a, a, a waffle cooking for about 30 minutes in a malfunctioning toaster. It was not my fault. Let me just say it was not my toaster. But there was the smoke alarms went off. They had to open the roof. They had to evacuate the building. It was, uh, and he called me, and he's like, my wife is driving past the Family Justice Center. Dear God, tell me you have nothing to do with that evacuation. And I was like, well, it's funny you should call. <laughs> so I thought, you've lost your mind. And not to mention, I'm a prankster. You know, I like to play practical jokes. And uh, I said, I don't think I'm Supreme Court material. And he said, this isn't about you. This is about the Indian community. And it's time that we have a seat at the table because we don't have one. And you are going to apply because it is your responsibility and it is your obligation. So I thought, well, all right, it's not going to work, but I did. And so I applied and lo and behold, I got an interview, which was a shock. And I thought, well, now I'm going to have to put on those clothes. Whoever was discussing clothes earlier, I am so with you. Because normally I'm in a Johnny Cash t-shirt. I mean, I, I actually like showered, put on like big girl clothes today. Um, and so I got the interview and then I made it to the governor. And I remember saying, uh, I said, oh, I'm going to the mansion. And they said, no, it's the governor's residence. And I said, I grew up in a trailer house, so it's a mansion. <laughs> and Governor Dayton at the time asked me a question. He said, what would Federal Dam think of the Supreme Court of Minnesota. And I said, they would think that it is not for them because it isn't for them. What do they possibly have in common? How could they possibly feel like they're represented? It couldn't be more foreign. And he must have liked the answer 
because I had sent my family on vacation, you know, when they leave and you're so happy that they've left. Because if you leave something there on the kitchen counter, you come back, it's still there. You buy a piece of cake, you open the refrigerator, it's still there. So I was excited that they had left. He called, he said he wanted to appoint me. And then it's a feeling of really, it's overwhelming because you think about um, what are my district court colleagues going to think? Are they going to think that I've sold out? What is my people in my fellow community members going to think? Were they going to be okay that I was going to be the first Native person on a court? And it was extremely overwhelming, and buyers are more certain on the court were really difficult. The very first conference that I went into, uh, I remember them talking and it literally was like wah, 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 with a lot of syllables. And I thought, I am in the wrong place because it's a vocabulary that is completely foreign to me. Uh, one of our clerks, I said, uh, where's the rest of them? And they said, she said, well, they took the circuitous route. I said, they took the what? Circuitous route. I said, what does that mean? I said, does that mean the long way around? She said, yeah. I said, then why don't you just say that? <laughs> and I am not kidding that even today, yes, it's almost six years on the court, but there are still words used that are extremely foreign to me and words that I do not know. But I have learned to, instead of struggle, and have a lot more moments of self-doubt. I still have moments of self-doubt, but hopefully they are less. I have to honor the fact that hopefully I offer something different. I had written a letter to Justice Sotomayor. I had read her book, and her words in that book reminded me of, I could hear my voice in there. You know, she grew up in the projects, poor in New York. She was a diabetic, my dad was diabetic. He died from it after losing both of his legs. Uh, and she had lots of life experience that was similar to mine. And I had written to her, and she actually called the chambers. And I had the chance to meet her. And I asked her, does she ever feel like she doesn't belong? And she said, every day. And she said, that's why it's so incredibly important that you are where you are, and you're going to go back there, and you're going to work hard, and you're going to do the best you can. I'm like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma'am. But it was her moment of kindness in reaching out to me that has helped me believe that I actually can do this and that I actually do have something to offer. And I would be remiss, he, he's like, don't talk about me when you get up there. I'm like, I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about me. <laughs> but Justice Lillehog has also done that for me. He was a friend of me on the court. I can go to him and I could say anything and he did not make me feel like I was stupid. And it's incredibly important in that the role that you play in the people that you are speaking to that you make them feel comfortable so that they don't feel like they're stupid or that they can't trust you and that they can't ask you for help because believe me, it is incredibly hard. You are overburdened. You are working way too hard. There is not enough time for you to spend with your clients. That adds to the problem. We have to change that because these are real people with real life problems. You know this, but we need to get to the rest of the world to know that. Because it could be someone we know. You know, I had a, a letter that came yesterday to the chambers, and it's a young man that I had uh, worked with when I was a county attorney. I had removed him. Uh, he first was removed when he was two years old. And he went through 17 different placements. He's been physically abused. He's been sexually abused. You can sort of imagine what has happened. He spent um, all of his time in different placements. He graduated then from, from being a kid in need to delinquency to an adult criminal. He has spent 12 years in prison. He was released. He was doing very well. And then more tragedy struck. His fiance died of an overdose. Uh, he has gone downhill and he sent me a letter that I received yesterday and he said that uh, it was so, he had done so much hard work because he had had a job, he had a place to live, 
Uh, he had his driver's license for the very first time. For the very first time, he was off paper. I was so incredibly proud of him. Um, and unfortunately, he has fallen back. And he said, you know, he's recently been arrested on two felony third degree burglaries. And he said, it took me so long to get, feel like I was making progress and the fall has happened so quickly. He said, I need your help. You told me once that you would not abandon me. He said, please have grace on me. And so I wrote him back immediately yesterday and told him, you can do this. You're strong. But he has no one. I've had many other people that I removed or was involved with in some capacity, and not a positive capacity, who have called me at the Minnesota Supreme Court. What does that tell us? What does that tell us? That they feel like they have no one else that they can call, that you, the only person you can think of is to call somebody who might have been responsible for you losing your children? To me, that speaks volumes. And so it is with that that I really feel like, you know, you become overwhelmed. I was talking to one of my colleagues on the court yesterday about the letter that I received, and I showed him, and I said, you know, I don't know what to do for him because he's so incredibly broken. And you think about what services or what can we do to give him the support that he needs, and he needs constant support. He's FASD. He's got zero family. His mother is in a a nursing home for her mental health issues. He's got one sibling who died. His other siblings are not doing well. And uh, my colleague said, I'm so depressed. And I said, yes, but we have to brush ourselves off and we have to think about how we can change this system. Because if we don't do this, who's going to? And we have an obligation, responsibility, to do the very best that we can to make things better for those that we serve. Because frankly, that's who are the consumers of what is supposed to be this equal justice system. I know that we can do it. I know that we can do it if we do it together. But we need more allies. I want you to know, as I come here today, that you're not alone that there are other people who care. And we need to continue to put people with different voices in positions of authority and in positions of power. So I ask you that when you know someone, perhaps like me, perhaps different, who is thinking or perhaps you can encourage to actually seek out these positions, because I wouldn't have done it if Judge Blazer had not come to me. But I still need my allies like David Lillehog to help me feel like it's something that I can do because I still have that self-doubt. You know, uh, Justice Sotomayor says that when she goes to bed at night, she thinks about two things. She says she thinks about what did I learn today and what act of kindness have I done today? And she said if I haven't done an act of kindness, I get out of bed and I send an email. If I haven't learned anything, I pick up a book and I read a few lines until I feel like I've learned something new, and then I go to bed. And I think that's such amazing advice. And that leads me to what I want to end you with, which is, you know, I'm not big on quotes, but I remember listening to something that, or reading something that Maya Angelou had said, and is that people don't necessarily remember all the things that you did for them, but they certainly remember how you treated them. And so you are the ones who are the conduit to those who need us the most. You are the ones who could continue to do the work. I'm so internally grateful to you, and I want you to know that I will continue to do all that I can in the job that I have to help to make the system better because I believe it is my obligation, and I actually believe it's now my destiny. I hope that you have a great conference. I will be seen around. I'm trying to keep you on schedule. Um, so thank you so much for allowing me to come today. I say to all of you, chimigwich.
represented. Peggy Flanagan grew up in a Minneapolis suburb and graduated from the University of Minnesota with majors in American Indian Studies and Child Psychology. She was a Minneapolis school board member for four years, and later she directed the renowned nonprofit Children's Defense Fund. Like many of us, she was inspired by the legacy of another Minnesotan, Senator Paul Wellstone, a progressive senator who died far too early in a plane crash in 2002. Senator Wellstone frequently politics isn't about money and game playing. Politics is about the improvement of people's lives, end quote. And Wellstone's legacy summarizes Peggy Flanagan's public service. She served in the Minnesota House of Representatives, during which she was a leading advocate for child care and was one of the founders of the People of Color and Indigenous Caucus. In 2018, she was invited by then U.S. Representative Tim Waltz to join his ticket for governor. And in my opinion, that was one of the keys to the ticket's victory. Like the vice president, whose constitutional duties are to preside over the Senate and inquire daily about the president's health, there is precious little in the Minnesota Constitution about the role of a lieutenant governor. But again, in my opinion, Flanagan has carved out a very important and powerful role. She's at the table, and you see her hand in the executive branch's decisions, including, notably, on judicial appointments. And even with a healthy governor, she is a powerhouse. Please welcome Minnesota's Lieutenant Governor, Peggy Flanagan. Got a lineup of Anishinaabe Kwe's of Ojibwe women. I like it. Uh, Justice Lilahog, thank you for that kind uh, and generous introduction. I appreciate it and I appreciate your leadership so very much. And thank you for all of the work that you do. I'm going to continue to thank everyone in this room because it is the work. And after the last several years that we've all experienced collectively, um, your work has never been more important. Uh, Justice McKegg, um, I got to catch the tail end of your speech, and I don't know about you, but I am always inspired by Justice McKegg. And she was the justice who swore me into this office, so if you have any problems with anything that has happened so far, you can take it up with Justice McKegg. But I'm excited to be joining you today with, for this year's Equal Justice Conference. It sounds like this is the first time in several years when folks have been able to get together in person. And I don't know about you, but I am an extrovert. So the last couple of years have been a little rough. But now I come home from events and my husband's like, whoa, whoa, he's an introvert. Um, and I'm like, hey, what do you want me to do now? And he's like, go to bed. And I was like, okay, or we could go to Target. We could watch a movie. Like, what should we do? Um, but I'm very excited uh, to be here. And I'd like to thank the American Bar Association and the National Legal Aid and Defender Association for having me and hosting such a great event on such an important and timely topic. If there ever was a time for us to come together and share and learn from each other about ways in which we can expand civil law and civil law aid to low-income communities, it is now. Throughout the pandemic, civil legal aid worked tirelessly and continued to meet the needs and ongoing challenges faced by communities in Minnesota. And the last two years have taught us all many lessons. The pandemic very early on was often referred to as the great equalizer. And you know that that could, couldn't be further from the truth. The health impacts and economic hardships didn't create disparities on our society. It only further exposed and exacerbated them. Your clients need you now more than ever before. The work of civil legal aid and organizations and pro bono advocates is critical to ensuring that everyone has meaningful access to justice, regardless of their income status. Unlike the criminal justice system, people are oftentimes left without the ability to meet and consult with attorneys prior to making important decisions that can ultimately impact the rest of their lives. Our legal system can be very challenging to navigate. 
And when you factor in additional barriers that folks face, like poverty, language barriers, cultural considerations, lack of transportation, lack of childcare, and distrust of the court system, it can be easy to get overwhelmed and discouraged by the process. And let me tell you, um, as someone who is working inside a system every day that wasn't created for me or by me or those like me, it's a challenge. And I'm the lieutenant governor and I feel overwhelmed. So it takes a commitment to working to ensure that the system works better for all folks. And as Justice McCagg mentioned, having people who come directly from communities who experienced many of the things that you are working on to be in positions of power. And it takes people in, in these positions who are doing the work in real time to help those who need it now. It's hard to imagine some of the challenges that people face when they engage with our civil legal system. Whether you're a survivor of intimate partner violence who is seeking safety for themselves or their children, or a family who is facing housing instability because of a wrongful conviction from their home, it is legal service providers and pro bono attorneys like you who step up to ensure that justice is administered fairly. That's why the work that you do is so critically important to ensuring that everyone has the opportunity to be counseled by an attorney so that they understand their rights and can make informed decisions. The Walls Flanagan administration recognizes the important role that legal aid plays in our justice system. That's why Governor Walls and I continue to stand behind you to fight to ensure that you have resources that are needed to successfully serve those in your community. So our proposed budget this year includes nearly 12 million in funding for 2023 and 23 million in funding for 2024 and 2025 for additional funding for legal services, for salaries, technology updates, and to expand staffing to address the COVID-19 related backlogs, largely uh, for people who are facing evictions during the pandemic. So uh, right now at the legislature, it's go time. So if you're gonna make a call, I do it today. Now we all know that despite what the governor and I believe, right, is essentially the best way, right, to uh, fund uh, all of our priorities here in Minnesota, as I just mentioned, calling the legislature can make a big difference. Um, and because we have equal branches of government, which is a good thing, uh, we all have to work to get this across the finish line. Um, but I think you all have incredibly important stories to tell, and they need to be heard. Too often, the decisions that are made within halls of power come down to facts and figures and statistics it's easy to brush them aside. What we need to hear about is the real human beings who are impacted by the work. We need to hear about what this work means to all of you. And so I encourage you uh, in these final days of the legislative session to share with electeds what is at stake. Since taking office, our administration has been committed to ensuring that our judiciary reflects Minnesota's full diversity. This has been a top priority for the governor, myself, and our entire team of partners who work diligently through the appointments process. Over a quarter of our appointees to the state district court bench are people of color, an all-time high in Minnesota. And this has included appointing people of color to serve uh, to several regions in Minnesota for the first time. Our view of diversity in judicial appointments also includes appointing judges who understand the real barriers that people face when engaging in our civil justice system. That's why we're proud that several of our judges who've been appointed since the start of our administration have backgrounds working in civil legal service organizations. Faith and trust in our judiciary system relies on people like you who step up. And I applaud you and your admirable work. And let me just say that I stand before you as a lieutenant governor because of people like you. I'm a survivor and I'm a child witness. And it took me a long time to be able to talk about it. But I need to talk about it. 
because these are the issues that, as we're talking about Paul Wellstone, that Sheila Wellstone oftentimes would say, right? You try to keep it behind closed doors, but it spills out into the street, and it spills out into community, and it upends people's lives. If my family didn't have someone like you, I don't know that I would be here today, and I don't know that my mom would be alive today. So I didn't plan on saying that, but I felt moved to. Because I want you to know that I understand what you do and why it matters. So there are other young people like me who are with their moms who are afraid of what comes next. And there are people like you who give folks hope, who guide them, and sometimes literally hold their hand. So I just want to say, Gichi Miigwech, thank you for everything that you have done to get people, to get our communities, to get our state to this moment. You deserve investment. We will fight for it. And I want to just thank you in advance for everything that you will do for kids just like me. Thanks so much. Um, let's see what else I have to cover here. 
uh, host a community reception. I mentioned you need your name badge to get in, but I do want to encourage you to go. If you saw the slide, you saw that our host committee has worked incredibly hard to put this reception together and provide a memorable experience for you all. Um, whether you're participating in the Story Slam as a storyteller or as an audience member to encourage our storytellers, um, you are valued there. And definitely the rest of those committee reception will provide entertainment and enjoyment and opportunity to network with each other. So please make time in your schedule to go either before dinner, after dinner, or skip dinner and be there the whole time. Um, lastly, I do want to note that, again, we ask you to be flexible. We ask you to be responsible. We're trying to keep this conference as healthy as possible because you all are doing such important work. We want you to be able to leave the conference on a Friday or Saturday, whichever day you depart. Go back to your offices and be healthy and do the important work that you need to do. If you happen to feel ill, please find any one of us with a beautiful red staff ribbon and talk to us. And we'll help you figure out the best way to go for it. With that, Thank you all for being here. It is so amazing to see everyone in person. We are so, so happy to have you all here. Um, please feel free to grab a coffee before you hit your next session and enjoy your day. Carry down the wave of motivation and inspiration by our speakers this morning. Thank you.